you so much. <laughs> it's so great to be back uh, uh, in Ann Arbor and in this building. Uh, very fond memories. I went, I went through the fourth floor trying to figure out where my office was. And in the process, I ran out. Uh, I, I, I met so many people from Urbana here. So I have my former student, Minji, here, who I will be mentioning a lot during the talk, who is now a professor in the department of, uh, hopefully I get that right, bioinformatics. And then Leigh and Vijay are our graduates from uh, University of Illinois. And please, uh, this color it was supposed to be maize. <laughs> it was not <laughs> supposed to be orange. I did not come here to make things difficult. <laughs> this was supposed to be maize. I tried the plain yellow maize in uh, maize and blue, but it didn't show up so well on the slides. So this is not supposed to be taken as orange. And the only time where you will see an orange eye is on this slide. And everything else, when you see this color, think of maize, not <laughs> orange. So I am really happy to be here to reiterate. And uh, I uh, it titled my talk according to a song that many of you may not know, but those of us that are a little bit older <laughs> may remember a song, Those Were the Days, My Friend. And I will be re uh, referencing that song throughout the uh, uh, presentation as well with the hope that some of these lines uh, make some nice messages regard or convey some nice message regarding uh, how much uh, I enjoyed my time here and how much I appreciate being a Michigan alumni and in particular now a distinguished alumni. So thank you all for being here. So um, the immigrant experience, I came here in 1997. Michigan was the first place I entered when I came to the US. And I, ent I came on April Fool's Day, <laughs> it was a bad sign. My parents told me, that's, that's a bit uh, iffy. You come in on April 1st, you may come back pretty soon. It's a bad day to travel, but I said, okay, a day like any other day, April 1st. And uh, I was admitted in the program a few months before, early 1997. And uh, I got some other offers. Most of us apply to as many schools as we can, and depending on the funding we have. And I was trying to figure out where to go, and then I ended up talking, and I don't know why the image is distorted a little bit, with Professor Steve McLaughlin. Steve was uh, a Michigan graduate as well. And Steve and I got to know each other when I was an undergraduate, actually. We worked together on a bunch of papers on constraint coding through our through my uh, then advisor, Bane Vasic. And uh, Bane Vasic introduced me to Steve. They were both working for Coda, <coughs> I believe. And Steve told me, it's a no-brainer. You have to go to Michigan. I wrote you a letter for Michigan. You have to go to Michigan. I am from Michigan. So forget about all the other choices, go to Michigan. And I said, I trust you, Steve. And I think, Dave, you were Steve's advisor, wasn't you, weren't you? So he said, there's no better place than Michigan. So I took good advice, and I decided to join University of Michigan. And so lesson one, always accept good advice. When you have friends and people you work with, you trust, and they give you advice, take it seriously. And I can uh, say for sure that I never regretted taking uh, the advice that Steve gave me to join Michigan. So as I mentioned, after deciding to come to Michigan, I had to plan the trip. And it happened so that April Fool's Day, April 1st, 1997, was the day when I came to the US, entered the US. And I recall vividly that I flew with the British Airways plane. And that was my first Atlant a transatlantic flight. And those of you that ever flew with me on a plane know that I'm absolutely terrified of flying. And I was even more scared then, if that's possible, than now. Uh, Alon Orlitsky, Amina Sholyan, and those are some names that people from this uh, room can recognize. They regret dearly flying with me because whenever there is even the slightest turbulence, I would just dig my hand, uh, nails into their hands and start <laughs> asking for ice and whatnot to, to get a little bit, uh, uh, you know, to come down a little bit. And I remember I was terrified because these transatlantic flights experience a lot of turbulence. We all know that. 
But the good news was um, that at the beginning, I was worried about every little noise I heard. Uh, for example, during takeoff, there was this weird noise that made me sure that I'm never going to make it to Michigan. We are crashing right away. And then there was some noise five minutes into the flight. And again, I took that as a sign. Some, the, the, flight ha the plane has some technical problems. But as luck would have it, I was sitting next to a retired British Airways pilot. <laughs> and uh, it's not this pilot. I was trying to find, obviously, some picture of him, but I didn't even remember his name. And he uh, gave me probably the best lesson about flying and fear of flying that I could get. He said, noise is good. If you don't hear that noise, that's a bad sign. And he said, oh, during takeoff, the noise you heard was when the landing gear was uh, raised, then the flap wings have to be brought back in. And he said, noise is good. Don't worry about noise. When you don't hear that, that means something is off with the plane. And to be honest, I enjoyed my conversation with the retired British Airways pilot so much. I felt I learned so many things during that six, seven hours flight. I said, maybe I'm really made up to be a, someone who studies aerospace engineering because, hey, after all, I know all these things now uh, that I was taught during the transatlantic flight. But then, again, the message, noise is good, stayed with me because uh, before I joined Michigan, I worked with um, Steve McLaughlin and Don Evasic on air control coding. And that is all about noise and dealing with noise. And I said, you know, let's just stick to the things that I know probably better than aerospace engineering, which is how to combat noise. And I just want to make sure you understand this is no longer an area known as coding theory. I was advised to call it learning how to decode, because nowadays <laughs> coding theory doesn't sell too well, but machine learning does. And what else is coding theory than us trying to learn how to decode? And kudos to the two authors whose book I used just before I came to Michigan to learn about coding theory, Shulian and then Costello, who later on uh, ended up being great colleagues and uh, friends. So lesson two, it's OK not to know what you want. I was flip-flopping about what should I really do when I get to this famed place called Michigan and Ann Arbor. And uh, the message is you, you can change your mind but you cannot always get what you want because uh, sometimes you, you believe you're qualified to do something and you're not. So my dreams about aerospace engineering faded away as soon as I made it to Ann Arbor. Um, and I didn't complete the story about flying yet because my flight with British Airways got me to Chicago. And then I had to wait for the connecting flight to uh, uh, Detroit and then I saw a plane like this. Again, it wasn't the original, but it had a propeller. And that scared me even more. Because what the pilot told me during the transatlantic flight, he said, there is a redundancy in terms of the number of engine, engines you have. You, uh, th these engines barely ever fail. And he told me, it's not like propellers. Those are much <laughs> more, <laughs> more dangerous. I saw this, and I said, no way am I flying this plane. So what did I do on the spot at the Chicago airport at O'Hare? I said, there must be another way to get to Ann Arbor. And then, sure enough, I heard about the train called the Wolverine. <laughs> And that was my first exposure to the word Wolverine. Um, later on, obviously, I started digging in. We had the internet in those days, and you could search. Google was not, I think Google was not the search engine of choice. Maybe Yahoo was more preferred at that time. But I decided to not fly with that propeller plane. Uh, I took a train, and I heard about the word Wolverine. And I am very obsessed with animals. <laughs> Those of you that know me well know that any animal has my sympathy, and I'm very much vested in uh, uh, animal rights. And I obviously immediately started to search, what is a wolverine? It's definitely not just a train. It's an animal. And there was a colleague of mine here on campus 
who was very knowledgeable about all matters of uh, American history and American wildlife. And he said, a wolverine is a vicious beast. It attacks bears, it can fight bears. That's why they are called wolverines. And I was, oh wow, that's interesting. And then he said, you should check out General Custer and his wolverines, a book about uh, the uh, Battle of Little Bighorn. And the problem was, I grew up in a country with traditionally rooted for Native Americans, so I couldn't sympathize much with, no offense, Custer's uh, Wolverine Brigade, but I got very excited to learn more about the Native American community in uh, Michigan and uh, the tribes that lived here. And I even managed, and I'm sorry again, the uh, images are a little bit blurred, uh, I even managed to go to a bunch of powwows while I was here in Ann Arbor. And I recall one in Pontiac, again, probably not the right picture, it was a long time ago, uh, called Dance for Mother Earth that le left a big impression on me. And uh, it's one of the passions I still have uh, to learn as much about Native American history as possible. Uh, and there are so many books and so much literature about Native American tribes in this area and in general, uh, the history of Native Americans in the US. And then not to stop at that, I also wanted to know more about the actual animal, the Wolverine. And I found this article and I, I miraculously, I managed to dig it out from the internet as well, <coughs> which asked, the defining questions, did wolverines ever live in Michigan? We call ourselves, or we call ourselves <laughs> wolverines. <laughs> so according to the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, the wolverines were uh, native to Michigan, but they get, got extinct more than 200 years ago, which means no way Custer soldiers it's ever saw a real wolverine. Probably, you know, when the university was founded? <laughs> it's about yeah, 200 years, roughly. <laughs> True. There is apparently only one genuine Michigan Wolverine, and I'm trying to figure out. It's in the visitor center at Bay City State Park, and it's the first Wolverine genetically verified to have lived in Michigan. So any other Wolverine you see, it's a fake one. It's not a Michigan Wolverine. <laughs> And there are some confirmations of sightings of wolverines in 2004 and 2010, but ever since, no wolverine sightings in all of Michigan. That's a bit sad. So uh, treasure your wolverines and your native life. That's my next message. Uh, and respect your native heritage uh, it, because it's a beautiful one for this place. And then somehow, after probably six hours, because I came by train yesterday and it took six hours. <laughs> I was convinced that it's a shorter trip, but it took me six hours to come to Ann Arbor. And I remember uh, settling in, in the, one of the Willow Tree apartments. So if you were students in Michigan, you know that Willow Tree had a bit of a reputation of probably not being the best place, but it, is, um, it was a good place to start with, let's put it that way. And uh, I was always a vegetarian, always meaning since the age of five, six. So I was in search of a place where I can eat and obviously I ended up in downtown Ann Arbor. And I learned about some places to eat on uh, campus here. That was the first time I tried out the famous uh, uh, Little Caesar pizza. <laughs> I think the uh, pizza pizza slogan, I didn't even realize why do you repeat pizza pizza twice until much later. But that's where I was uh, basically uh, going to eat. And again, this is a blurred picture of Ann Arbor. But believe it or not, I knew quite a lot about Ann Arbor even before I came in. I did my due diligence to figure out what is so notable about Ann Arbor. Uh, first of all, as you could tell, I like music a lot. So my, the title of my talk is the title of a song that I will mention. But there was another song, sometimes even now when I'm feeling lonely and beat, uh, I drift back in time and find my feet down on Main Street. Does anyone know this song? 
Yes, <laughs> I know that the older <laughs> um, yeah. Michigandrs know this song. Uh, this is Bob Seeger, and my partner always pro <laughs> corrects my, my pronunciation, but that's a famous song about Ann Arbor uh, uh, down on Main Street. Actually, he was referring to Ann Street, which I think uh, borders Main Street, and it was a very, very popular song, and it talked about Ann Arbor. The other thing that I knew about Ann Arbor is that Iggy Pop went to school here. And I was a big fan of Iggy Pop. He collaborated with some famous directors, movie directors from former Yugoslavia, like um, Emil Kusturica. They wrote, um, the, uh, he wrote the music for Arizona Dreaming, a bunch of other movies that he made. And Iggy Pop shares the same birthday. You're a bit age-wise, he's older, but the date is the same. So I knew about Iggy Pop, and I was really impressed that he is, he was a student here as well. I think he was born in Muskogee, if I'm pronouncing it properly, in Michigan, but he went to school here. All of you know that Madonna went here, so that I knew as well. I wasn't that impressed. I was not, <laughs> I was not a big fan, no offense to Madonna. Uh, she was a trailblazer when it comes to uh, women performers, but uh, I was more into Iggy Pop. And all of you probably remember that 97, the year I came in, was a big year for Michigan football. I learned about the Rose Bowl, and I learned about the word football, because to me, this was not football. This was something very different. <laughs> uh, and I still refuse to call uh, soccer, uh, football soccer, because in Europe, football is football. You hit the ball with your foot. <laughs> it doesn't really make sense to call this. To each other, but okay, it's American football, and uh, 97 was when Michigan won the Rose Bowl. And an interesting thing is, uh, one of the first times I went to Michigan uh, theater, there were two guys, rowdy guys, sitting in front of me, and they were talking nonstop, and then they had their feet on the seats. And I was very irritated by that. And I told them, gentlemen, this is inappropriate, move your feet because someone else has to sit there. And then someone tapped me and said, that's Tom Brady and... <laughs> <laughs> Tom who? I don't care. <laughs> he has his feet on the seats. Tom Brady should know how to behave. And um, funny enough, he said, oh, I'm sorry, ma'am. And I'm like, oh, ma'am. <laughs> I hate when I'm called ma'am, especially at that age, but he moved his feet. And then later on, uh, I couldn't believe basically what Tom Brady managed to achieve. It was uh, a miracle to see him win so many uh, uh, titles, but he also ended up being good friends with Novak Djokovic again from my country, because they're, they always discuss uh, longevity in sports and how to ma manage to uh, play and be active until their 50s and 60s, basically. So it was a nice thing to say, oh, I know that guy. I met that guy. I, I was very rough with him. I told him to move his feet away so that people wouldn't sit on something that's dirty. <laughs> so I really got to love Ann Arbor. I presented only a few slides to tell you about a few things that I knew or I learned about the place. And as an immigrant, you often think that it's very hard to call a place home if you don't have your family, all the things that you hold dear and that you remember so well. But it took me really no time to start calling Ann Arbor my home. And it's a great place and it's a great place to start your career and it's a great place to be here and live here in general. So kudos to Ann Arbor. One thing that was a bit of a rough start, <laughs> was um, my introduction to EECS, Electrical and, uh, Engineering and Computer Science, because this, uh, a few months after moving to Willow Tree, uh, uh, staying in Willow Tree, as many of you know, there, so there were some bug infestation <laughs> issues with that place. So I had to move to North Campus, and I think it was Northwood. 
And at that time, we had a horrible outbreak of twisters. I'd never seen a tornado in my whole life. It was one of the scariest experiences because I don't know how many of you took that uh, or know that path that leads up from, I think, Gigi Brown up to Northwood. Apparently, in 97, there were 13 twisters. A lot of them hit the Detroit area as well, and they brought down all the trees on that path. So I didn't know what the tornado was. We were all hiding somewhere. I remember that there were sirens. We were hiding here in leaks. And then the next thing I know, somewhere here where that path was, all the trees were down. So I couldn't even get back to Northwood. And uh, then I started learning about twisters, but I won't get that far. <laughs> what, uh, what about tornadoes and how often they uh, make appearance in the Midwest? And then some face you may know. This is Tara Javidi. I think she was our yours <laughs> uh, distinguished al alumni winner from two years ago. The first person I met as a student here, uh, the first student I met was Tara. She came to my office and she said, "Oh, I am uh, heading the student association. Uh, I heard uh, we just got a new student joining in the systems group. I want to introduce you to everyone." So Tara came along. And then she introduced me to Chris Law, and I couldn't find a picture of Chris, uh, a younger Chris. That's Chris right now, but he was younger in those days. Who <laughs> was also, <laughs> also uh, a student of Demos Tenekets, as both of them were working with Demos. So she introduced me to Chris, and Chris and I had one thing in common, the, uh, one thing that we really were passionate about, music. <laughs> Chris was singing in the choir, and I think he was singing with uh, Al Hiro. Al Hiro and him were in the same choir. And uh, Chris and I would often, when we stay for a long time in, in the Eats building, find the corner when everyone is gone and try to harmonize. I remember us singing Sound of Silence <laughs> in some of the hallways, and uh, I, I thought it was pretty good. So I met Chris, I met Naveen Kashyap, who was Dave's student, and um, Naveen was one of our, you know, um, how would I describe it? Voice of reason, whenever we get out of control and we get too rowdy or ambitious about something, Naveen would make sure to put us down <laughs> in our place. And he was incredibly mathematically gifted. He's a professor in India now. And he still works in an area that I thoroughly enjoy learning about. And he was a great friend, too. Uh, I just learned that this person here, Mahesh Godavarti, who was Al Hero's student, uh, and was uh, probably my best friend here in Michigan, he also went to school with Vijay. And Mahesh and I, uh, after all these years, he didn't go to academia, but I keep saying this, and I stand firmly behind it, he was the smartest of us, of the, this group. He was the local genius of Eeks, I would say. Mahesh was an invaluable friend during some difficult times when I lost my father while I was here in Michigan. And uh, he continued being a great friend and support. Uh, even after we graduated, he moved to California. And Celine, that I don't know if you remember, she was more in the signal processing area. She's now with our enemies, <laughs> but we will forgive her. She was uh, one of the uh, crowd as well. So we had a really, really good time. And there are many other people, but I'm singling these out because I spent most of my time with this group of people, and they became uh, outstanding friends. And where did we hang out? So Naveen was the one that liked to do research over a glass of beer. <laughs> so Naveen would uh, tell you, if you ask him, I did my best research in the brown jug. So Naveen convinced us that the right place to go and do research and write papers and do homeworks was the brown jug. And to be honest, the uh, first time I entered and I said, couldn't have even picked the worst dump. How are we going to do research here? There is, you know, there, be, there is spilled beer on the table. There is all sorts of dirt. 
but you get so quickly fond of that place. I think we spent most of our productive time there. And Naveen is right. We did a lot of good homework solutions and research there. And this is where I thought this reminded me of the song, Those Were the Days, My Friend. Uh, because it talks about the tavern and about friends meeting. So once upon a time, there was a tavern where we used to raise a glass or two. Naveen probably did the two. We did the one or zero. And remember how we laughed away the hours. Think of all the great things we, were do, we would do. And that's really true. I don't know if you know the song. It's Mary Hopkin. It has a very catchy melody. If you Google, now we have the internet, Google, one, um, those were the days, my friend. And the message is very clear. We were young and sure to have our way. And we all had ambitions. We all had dreams in terms of what we were going to do after finishing our PhD. But mo uh, I remember hearing that song in Brown Jug, and it uh, sounded like a, it seemed like a good place to mention it on this slide as well, except that we didn't really sing. I think Chris and I were too embarrassed to try to sing in brown jug, but uh, you can just replace with sing and dance forever and day with we proved and conjectured and it was mostly evening, not really day. But uh, yeah, that was our time in brown jug. And since we were in the neighborhood of the math department, we made sure to attend as many lectures and uh, really learn from the best people in the field at least in my opinion, uh, that were in our math department at that time. I think uh, we took uh, real analysis with the late Yuha Heinonen. We took, I personally took a lot of number theory classes. I'll mention them later. But it was a great place, um, a great location for the a place as well, because uh, Brown Jack and um, the math department are very close, so we would just go for lectures, then go to Brown Jack and do some homeworks, then go to another lecture. So it was a very fun experience. We were mostly on central campus, as you can tell, but occasionally we would obviously go back to North Campus. And uh, among friends, there are always some uh, discussions and issues and even potentially disagreements. And uh, we had many intellectual discussions, and one discussion, despite the fact that it's been more than 20 years since it happens, keeps coming up absolutely every conference when we meet again. And uh, those are pictures of us from the old days. Tara may be a bit younger, but OK. So what were the fights and the arguments we had as a group? Uh, we had a camp of established herbivores, and then we had a carnivore. And the carnivore was very vehement and passionate about her rights to eat meat. And uh, we, we had a lot of arguments about, is it ethical to eat animals? What do you do? So Tara made a statement that uh, she will tell you. <laughs> I am exaggerating. It wasn't exactly like that. But when we confront her jointly, she said, OK, yes, that was the message. The message was, I'm allowed to eat everything that is less intelligent than I am. <laughs> and we did not agree with that message, obviously, the early <laughs> wars. And uh, we kept carefully checking for missing people in an a uh, AA. And we continued <laughs> making sure that Tara doesn't do something silly in San Diego either. I don't want to say this, but someone said, did you see Tara's student recently? He didn't show up. <laughs> <laughs> really smart, but <laughs> you never know. So uh, if you ask her, she will agree. This is a true story. Sorry, true story. And she claims that based on this discussion, and she again doesn't want to give me credit for it, but that's fine. She said Mahesh's philosophical argument hit the, co uh, hit the note with her, and she stopped eating meat. But again, if you go to a conference, you would see Tara munching on lamb occasionally. So I don't, I'm not sure if I believe her, but let's for now say we convinced her to be a semi-carnivore or herbivore. So what is the lesson from the last few slides is at Michigan, you make friends for life. And you probably know that this is a very special place. It's uh, 
It's a place where you put aside all your differences, even if uh, you disagree with people eating meat. And uh, I didn't mention this, but uh, on the slides where I showed you my best friends from Michigan, you had people of all religions, all ethnic backgrounds, and we got, a lot, uh, we got along absolutely amazingly well. And I wish that the world would take a template from uh, an arbor and make sure that that applies uh, more broadly because there was nothing that would stand in the way of our friendship. And as many of you know, we are still very close together. Uh, we attend conferences. We occasionally even write uh, proposals together and do a lot of things together. And um, another thing is I mentioned that song by Mary Hopkin, Those Were the Days, My Friend. And I'm assuming maybe not everyone has heard about that song, but it was a big hit in the 1960s. And then my partner here, who is in the last row, he told me many, many years after I really fell in love with that song, he said, that's not a, an American song. That's actually a Soviet, a Russian song, and it's called The Long Road. Sure enough, I googled, I found the link, and yes, that was a Russian song. And those of you that work in math, any four area of math, know that whenever you give a presentation and you show very proudly a result you have, there will be someone in the audience saying, you know what, in Russia in 30 years ago, there was a result like that, and it was stronger than yours, and it had a better bound. <laughs> and then I say, you should check the literature. So I checked the literature. Apparently, my favorite song from the Brown Jug was never an American song. It was a Russian song. But the title is kind of similar, The Long Road. So if you want to hear another version of that song, type in Long Road, Boris Fomin. And uh, at the time when I was here in the math department, we had a great uh, combinatorics expert, Sergei Fomin. So you probably know the name. So everything is weirdly connected. And uh, how did my first semester go? Uh, I came in with, a, I believe, a master's degree. So I took equivalence or some transfer for some classes, but I was very intrigued with other classes that I haven't seen during my uh, master's thesis uh, uh, back in Yugoslavia. So I took source coding with Professor Newhoff. I took random processes with uh, Professor Hero. And I took error control coding with Professor Sean Coffey. And that was my first semester. I'm almost sure that those were the three uh, courses I took. And I had to do homeworks, something that we didn't do in Eastern Europe, or at least in uh, former Yugoslavia, after elementary school. We didn't even have homeworks in high school. We had oral exams, written exam, quizzes, but never a homework. So that concept was a bit rough. It took me a little bit of time to get used to homeworks. I said, that's not what I signed up for, but OK, let's do homeworks. And I remember, I won't mention which class it was, I was shocked that I didn't get the max on a homework. I'm like, what did I do wrong? And then apparently I didn't know what the word spouse means. So I thought it's a sibling or something. I mixed it up and I solved the uh, uh, question in probability theory so you can figure out which homework it was wrong. Then I said, this is not fair. These homeworks are testing your knowledge of, Eng of the English language, not of probability theory itself, but I got over it rather quickly, so it wasn't a big problem. Uh, you may ask, why did I come to Michigan, take source coding, error control coding, 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 and random processes? Why did I not take some machine learning course? And in those days, the really fascinating subjects were information theory and wireless. There was no machine learning. And uh, I found this uh, PhD comics as illustrative and as uh, informative or um, something that explains the dilemma we have or students have when they start doing some research. Uh, it says, why do you believe your research is insignificant? It will take some time for your research to become relevant, 20 years. And then in 20 years, you have to ask yourself, uh, is it, was it really worth it or not? 
Personally, I think doing research in coding theory was not a mistake. And as I said, there was no machine learning then. But the best things I did later on with coding theory were really trying to make uh, machine learning problems more exciting, at least to me, by adding some uh, coding theory component in it. Uh, nowadays, this is a snapshot of just the CS courses offered in Urbana. As you can tell, the landscape has changed a lot. I would be flunking out all these classes easily. Machine learning versus machine learning theory, there is a very subtle difference there. Then you have artificial intelligence, then you have deep learning, then you have programming methods, and the list goes on and on and on. And it's so complicated. I mean, in the old, good old days, we had, you know, channels theory, three areas, source coding, constraint coding, error control coding, and we knew exactly what we were learning and what we were doing. Now, it's a bit more convoluted, and I'll leave this uh, little <laughs> blob about what machine learning really is. Steer your data, <laughs> mix it, uh, steer it until you get the result you want out of the black box that you're using. Uh, maybe it's a bit exaggerated, but again, it's not my comic. <laughs> so that's how the world looks now when it comes to research. And uh, the lesson is be patient and wait for your turn. Your research may not have the impact that you expect, and people may think that you know, if you do machine learning now in 20 years, your work will still be impactful. Maybe not. Maybe the areas that you're paying very little attention to now will be the areas that matter in the future. Or what you thought didn't matter, like people were dismissing coding theory for a long, long time and years uh, before machine learning even came about. It turned out to be very useful in many problem areas, and those of you that work in that uh, in coding theory know that. So I didn't learn about machine learning, <laughs> unfortunately or fortunately, but I learned a lot, and I learned a lot from various faculty. One of my favorite faculty was Professor Demos, and he taught a beautiful course on Markov chains, and he used the book. I probably know you all had seen this book if you ever talked and worked with him, Introduction to Stochastic uh, Processes by Paul Port and Stone. Uh, Ming Yang and Ahil is taught wireless communications. I never did research in that area, but I took courses with them. And then somewhere after two years into my PhD, my advisor, who was a coding theorist, Sean Coffey, left. So I had to switch, and I think I asked Stefan Le Fortune for advice who to uh, talk to once uh, Sean left. And he said, there is a professor that really likes mathematics, especially discrete mathematics, and he works in logic as well. His name is Kevin Compton. Why don't you go and talk to him? And that was a really great suggestion. Again, great advice because I absolutely love working with Kevin. Why? Because he was the type of advisor that uh, had the go uh, multiple goals when dealing with students. First, to educate them as much as possible and make them know about as many areas in, of mathematics in particular as possible. And his approach was to make you really fall in love with the subject. Nothing was forced. So my meetings at the beginning with Kevin would never be meetings about research subjects. Our meetings were discussions about mathematical philosophy. I was not working in logic. He introduced me, nevertheless, to Kurt, uh, Kurt Gödel's work. So imagine having an advisor. You're supposed to write papers. You're supposed to be productive. But you go to your advisor, and then you have this beautiful revelation where you learn about some deep, deep mathematical truths. Uh, in his case, the truth he, that he made me aware of were related to Kurt Gödel's work. And I really looked forward to meetings with him. You know, nowadays, when I tell my students, can we meet tomorrow? And they say, I'm not done with this proof. And I said, so what? <laughs> let's just meet and let's chat about some nice paper that you read or something that I've seen. 
And uh, I really feel that that approach worked very well for me. I don't know about other students, but uh, Kevin introduced me to Kurt Gödel's work. We talked about the incompleteness uh, theorems. He mentioned the book. I never heard about Gödel Escher Bach before I uh, became Kevin's student. And as I mentioned, I was very much into music. Bach resonated well. I just learned about Gödel. I didn't know anything about Escher. But uh, interesting enough, I know I don't know how many of you know this is a this is an amazing book, Pulitzer Award winning book, and uh, Doug Douglas Hofstetter was actually a professor here in Michigan for about five years in the 80s, if I'm not wrong, and it's a fantastic book. And in addition, without being really asked to know or learn about it, I became really obsessed with the work and life of Kurt Gödel. So there was a book written about his friendship with Albert Einstein, and um, it claimed that the best kept secret in physics is that time does not exist. <laughs> and that's why it's called a world without time. But I recently saw some articles coming out confirming that time is linear. So I don't know, maybe both Gödel and Einstein didn't know what they were doing, but I warmly recommend uh, reading the book A World Without Time, which discusses their friendship as well as some deep and interesting facts in physics and logic. And uh, with Kevin, once we finished our intellectual discussions about all matters of mathematics, we had to do some research as well. So with him, I worked on symbolic computing. Um, most of you probably don't know what that means, but in those days, uh, people were uh, uh, trying to figure out if there is a way to get closed form solutions for complicated combinatorial expressions by using an automated approach. And uh, uh, Zeilberger, a famous mathematician, pioneered that field. And it was a very beautiful subject, but very few people really cared about it. I was one of them, and Kevin was one of them. The other thing that I worked with, uh, worked on with Kevin was random walks. And that's not me, even after Brownshock, I wouldn't do a <laughs> random walk like this. But yes, uh, random walks that are incredibly important and still very useful, even in that magical area we call machine learning. I will comment on that a little bit later. So part of my analysis, average case analysis of symbolic computing algorithms involved doing uh, some pretty, pretty in-depth analysis of random walks. And a thing that I especially liked was uh, learning about combinatorial earn models and uh, uh, so-called Tauberian theorems. Kevin was one of the people that had a Tauberian theorem named after him. So I don't want to go into details, but uh, I was very proud of my advisor. I noticed that books were devoted to him. He was so very knowledgeable uh, on so many subjects. And uh, my thesis included a, a Tauberian theorem of my own. I didn't want to call it the Milankovitch Tauberian theorem, obviously. But uh, it was useful to solve some questions regarding uh, uh, bins, and, bins and balls and urn models. And uh, I will mention this later. One of my first NeurIPS papers, I used uh, this idea that I had from my thesis regarding uh, urn models, bins and ball models. We use something called a double Dixie cup uh, problem, which is a coupon collector problem as well, but it's the same thing. And it was actually the only reason why I knew to use this approach was because from Kevin, I learned about the vast literature in this uh, area. And uh, Kevin also instilled great love for number theory. And that's why I spent so much time on, uh, in Central Campus. Uh, and I think it's sad that number theory has been uh, pushed aside for the sake of other types of mathematical areas. Because even the greatest mathematician of all time, undoubtedly, Gauss uh, made the claim mathematics is the queen of sciences and number theory is the queen of mathematics, and I stand behind it. It's the most beautiful area, in my opinion, of mathematics. And uh, 
at that time when I was in Michigan, we had an amazing math department. Amazing in so far that we had some of the leading experts in additive number theory, in multiplicative number theory. Um, I don't know if you, any one of you remembers Trevor Woolley. Then we had Hugh Montgomery. Sundar Rajan was there, but he left for Stanford. And that is one of the most exciting things I ever learned in the math department was a proof of the prime number theorem. And I think that was a class by Sundar Rajan. It sounds nerdy, and I don't want to admit it, but I cried after I saw that proof <laughs> because I didn't believe that things can be that beautiful and still expressed using Greek letters and uh, weird looking formulas, at least for those that are not experts, like the ones you see in the proof. It's one of my favorite results and one of the things that I wish I could have proved and done on my own, uh, myself, but unfortunately I didn't. And this is Hugh Montgomery. I, I think I audited and I took a bunch of classes with him. He was, um, I think he was Davenport student, another very famous mathematician. And he uh, did a lot on, as I mentioned, multiplicative number theory, Riemann zeta function, all these things that you think are probably not practically relevant now, but they're nevertheless beautiful and, and it's such an uh, exceptional intellectual uh, achievement for humankind that it's incredible just to read these proofs and even if you don't care about number theory. And how did my life after the PhD, which I so quickly went over, look like? It looked like a random walk again. <laughs> again, I wasn't sure where do I want to go, what school should I go and uh, teach. So my path, I'm just mentioning two places I also spent some time in San Diego. Sorry, San Diego is uh, my random walk first took me to Colorado, University of uh, Colorado Boulder. And I stayed there for uh, roughly three years. And then Tara and Alon Orlitsky invited me to spend a year at UCSD. And then Alon and I wrote some grants. We did some work together. And it seemed like a better choice to not go back to Colorado, but uh, move to Illinois, who made me an offer at that time. So my random walk went through a lot of different places, but the two important points were Colorado and Illinois. And once at Illinois, I had to do, I had no choice, let's put it that way, machine learning, because it became really popular really fast. And I will want to mention, for example, that uh, in machine learning, the things that I've been obsessing with the last years, many years, is learning on graphs and hypergraphs, and graph neural networks in particular. And that's where I used a lot of the material and the knowledge that I gained uh, and all the interesting facts I learned and proofs I learned from Kevin, because uh, graph neural network encoders really rely mostly on random walk approaches. So that was one really interesting thing that I felt my PhD thesis uh, positioned me well to do, uh, work on uh, graph neural networks. In coding theory, Ramanujan graphs, and it's very convenient because the, uh, Hugh Montgomery taught a class on uh, the work of Ramanujan. Uh, and Ramsey theory are really a big part in the development of the theory of low density parity check codes. So that was really interesting to apply in coding theory for me. Computational biology. Uh, last time I was here, uh, Dave was retiring. I told Dave, I'm enormously grateful to you because uh, I learned so much about compression. And at that time, NIH was uh, funding a lot of work for gen on genomic compression. And Dave, here is uh, my student, Minji, <laughs> in the first row, former student, who did work on genomic data compression using your notes. And she's now a professor here in the Department of Bioinformatics. Am I correct? Competition medicine and bioinformatics. Okay. <laughs> close enough, close enough. But Minji was one of the students that was really charged uh, uh, with working on uh, compression of various uh, genomic data. 
and source coding and signal processing was really invaluable in that area. And then molecular storage and computing is something that I was that I became interested in maybe five, six, eight years ago. And it's all about coding theory. And apparently, based on what I hear, a lot of the papers recently in coding theory are focused on um, genome, uh, are focused on um, uh, using coding theoretic ideas uh, that we had in the 60s and 70s, basically. So when I moved to Illinois, I ended up being colleagues uh, with someone from Michigan as well, Paul Coleman. He didn't get his PhD. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he was an undergraduate here. So Todd was infamous in the coordinated science lab for wearing Michigan slippers. <laughs> and his were really fuzzy. <laughs> I couldn't find that type of slipper online. I googled and googled and googled. They were really some interesting fuzzy Michigan slippers. And then we would talk to each other and ask, uh, oh, what did he do this weekend, thinking of Michigan football or Michigan basketball? Oh, what are, uh, are you planning to do this or that? And all the references we were really references to Ann Arbor, not to, to Michigan, not to Illinois. And one day, uh, Dick Blayhood, who was our department head at that time, came over and said, you two have to stop. <laughs> you cannot refer to Michigan as we. You are in Illinois now, so you have to say we when we talk about Illinois, not about Michigan. And Todd asked, does that mean that I have to lose my slippers? <laughs> and they said, OK, <laughs> I rest my case. Keep your slippers. So Todd was really famous uh, for his uh, Michigan slippers and for pretty much the same love that I have for uh, an Arbor. And it was really sad to see him go. He's uh, doing great now at Stanford. But here is another great Michigan alumni who uh, went and uh, made an impact. Uh, now he's working, I believe, in molecular biology. Before that, he was in neuroscience. And um, uh, what happened after? Uh, joining Urbana. What happened is a lot of different students came through my lab and uh, I felt really strongly up, uh, and very happy to have them in the group and I felt very strongly about working with them and advising them and they did exceptionally well. I didn't want to put the names in, it would be a bit too much I guess, but they are mostly professors or working for big uh, pharmaceutical companies or bio labs, and uh, I'll leave them uh, without names for now, but you can Google papers, there are some more, uh, uh, some that are recent, some that are uh, less recent, and this is by no means the exhaustive list of students that I had, it's just the ones whose pictures I could find online and who were the most recent ones in the group. But there is a special one here, and that's Minji, who I just introduced to you. And it's very sweet how uh, the whole situation with advising Minji came about, because Minji was an undergraduate, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, an undergraduate student at the University of California, San Diego, and she started working with Tara Javidi on, on a project as an undergraduate. And then Tara called me and she said, I have an undergraduate student who is really interested in doing more bio-related work, and she's applying to University of uh, 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 Illinois. And I said, sure, I'll have her, uh, I'll check her record out and I'll get in touch with her. And it didn't take us much time. I guess it was immediately clear we were going to work together. Minji joined my group, so she went from UCSD to UIUC. And then again, there was a random walk, but we'll cover all the uh, we'll uh, ignore all the details regarding the random walk. So after joining UIUC, she completed her PhD working on compression of genomic data, mostly and some other very exciting stuff. And guess where she ended up? Now she's Professor Minji Kim here at Michigan. So it's a little circle of life. I mean, student life, academic life. Uh, the friendship that uh, I may, uh, had from the old days at Michigan helped me recruit Minji. And then Minji ended up telling me that her favorite place to go was Michigan. And I wrote the letter, and I think her 
father, your father was a Michigan student as well. So it's incredible how many connections they are uh, with Michigan that are so uh, awarding and beautiful to see. And um, the conclusion of this part, the lesson that I wanna convey is, especially once you reach a certain age, you stop judging your success in terms of how many citations your paper gets or how well you are doing. You start measuring your success and the quality of your achievements through your students. Everything becomes about how well did your students do, how well uh, are their publications received, did they get their career <laughs> awards, did they do well. And that is probably the best thing, at least in my experience, to observe and um, you know, uh, cherish. Uh, I have students now that are at Georgia Tech that are uh, at Michigan, obviously, at uh, uh, Virginia, a bunch of other places. So those are the best products of my research program uh, since graduating. And to finish up with the song that I started with, the one that's claimed to be uh, 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 by Mary Hopkin and produced, I think, by the Beatles. I know that Paul McCartney was involved. That song ends uh, on a little bit potentially depressing note, but uh, forget about the rest of the text, focus on the maize-colored one. And it says, my friend, we are older, but no wiser, for in our hearts, the dreams are still the same. So pretty much nothing changed as soon as I came back to Ann Arbor. I saw the city, and it's really true. It's as if no, no time has passed since I was here last time, except for the fact that I got, got lost on campus, a lot of new <laughs> buildings and whatnot. The spirit of the place is still the same. That's at least how it feels to me. And the dreams we all had as students here, I think, are still intact. But a few buildings and potential price increases from what I heard are, are the only things that really changed here in Ann Arbor. And finally, I want to thank, uh, uh, I want to thank, oh, I went over time. I want to thank my family, and my family looks pretty fuzzy. <laughs> As I mentioned, I'm a big fan of animals, and I have a lot of them. I don't want to call them animals. They're my... Uh, my cats, <laughs> let's put it that way. And uh, a lot of uh, other pets from the Humane Society that I really embraced and I work with a lot in uh, uh, Urbana-Champaign. That's where I spend my time when I'm not at work. And it gives me a lot of inspiration to try to do some good, especially in the world of animals and other areas. Uh, and uh, combine that with uh, research with students, and there is no pun intended here. And special thanks to my partner who is also here. Uh, I really didn't want to put the picture of him, of his son on the screen, and he massaged his way onto the slides by saying, I have a really cute picture of Pixie the cat. <laughs> and I said, okay, I'll cut you out, I'll keep Pixie. And then I felt a bit guilty <laughs> because he went all the way uh, from Urbana with me, suffered through the six hours on the Wolverine and three hours on the Saluki train. So special thanks to him as well. And to all of you here, thank you for your attention again. This is May's, <laughs> not the orange one from Illinois. So thank you all for being here. It was a great pleasure to be here.